Thank you for joining us today for our fourth webinar in a series that focuses on improving immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence workflows. Today's webinar is about counterstaining in IHC. This will be presented by my colleague, Dr. Craig Powell. Following the 20-minute presentation, we will have 10 minutes for a Q&A session. Please feel free to submit any questions you may have using the chat function on the GoToWebinar site, and we will answer your questions accordingly. I am now pleased to introduce you my colleague, Dr. Craig Powell. Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Byron. Hello, everyone, and good morning. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you may be located around the globe. Thank you for joining us for this fourth webinar in our series. Now, our focus today, as Byron mentioned, is on counterstaining in immunohistochemistry. Now, just before I commence the webinar, uh, let me just explain why we feel this topic about counterstaining is important enough for a webinar. Now, as most of you know, the counterstaining uh, procedure is conducted right at the end of the IHC or immunohistochemistry workflow. Now, a lot of investigators work very hard to obtain the specimen uh, for the tissue preparation, blocking it, cutting it, doing the immunohistochemistry to get a good stain. But all too often at the end, what we see is uh, this particular counterstaining step receives very little attention and the counterstain is applied haphazardly or dogmatically, and it really detracts from the specific staining of their specimen that they've worked so hard to get. You know, uh, so suddenly it would have, you know, in many cases, a negative impact. So hopefully this webinar will give you some insights into how to optimize the counter stain and maximize your results for your immunohistochemistry specimen. Okay, without further ado. The brief overview will be what is a counter stain for those of you who may be new to the field, and we'll also look at why apply a counter stain in immunohistochemistry. Then we'll look at some commonly used uh, examples of counter stains for immunohistochemistry, some main considerations when applying a counter stain, and then we'll go over a brief summary. Okay, so I've got a bit of a definition here for those who are new to the field in what is a counter stain. And I've got here a dye or a stain that binds to cellular components and provides contrast with the specific immunohistochemistry enzyme substrate precipitate. You know, that may be fairly straightforward, but I believe this is a fairly elementary definition and doesn't really get to the point of why you may want to apply a counter stain or the value of a counter stain in immunohistochemistry. And indeed, I will say that one key facet of the counter stain is to augment the specific staining to generate additional information with respect to antigen localization, uh, regional or spatial expression of that antigen, and the tissue morphology. Now, if you remember the example on the title slide, the same image here. And what we've got is uh, this particular uh, brown staining circle. It's actually a lymphatic endothelial cell marker. And what we've done is also counter stain with a blue nuclear counter stain here. Uh, if we did not apply this counter stain, all we'd have would be this brown circle floating in space and not give you any appreciation of its uh, um, association uh, with this given arteriole. So certainly in this single stain example, you can see the value of why you would want to use a counter stain uh, for immunohistochemistry. Now I'm not a, well, just keep in mind this particular image as we go forward actually through, uh, through the webinar, I'll, I'll refer to, to back to this image a couple of times. Now I'm not a particular fan, I'll say, of the phrase counter stain, and I think this is probably a shortcoming, a little bit of the English language, but, but to take a counter position is to take an opposing position or an opposite position uh, from, from what is presented. And I don't like the idea of the counter stain being opposing necessarily to the specific stain. I like to think of them more as 
you know, compatibility or companion stains to work in concert with that specific staining and maximize the data you can get from your tissue section. Okay, let's look at some of the common counter stain choices that are, that are used out there for immunohistochemistry. And what I've got here is a short list of some of the hematoxylins that are used. Mayers, there's a modified Mayers, there's Gills type 1, 2, and 3, Harris, there's a modified Harris, Ehrlich's, there are other hematoxins as well. And what I've got here on this image uh, on the right is they all do give you blue nuclei, I'll use the phrase, at the end of the day. So any or all of these would certainly be suitable for generating this sort of image on the right hand side that I've got here. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there'd be uh, some considerations though, as we'll mention later on, about certain formulations of hematoxin. So just keep that in mind. Now I've got some investigators who uh, may not be particularly familiar with the techniques or some of the histology perspectives, and they tend to put on a hematoxin and eosin counter stain in combination with their immunohistochemistry. Now, hopefully the image I've got here showcases that, you know, there's just a, an absolute um, drowning of color uh, in this particular image. And at least from my perspective, uh, while you could apply a hematoxin and eosin with some given antigen expression uh, in immunohistochemistry, I really don't see there's a need for it. And the eosin could certainly work against uh, some of the specific staining you're trying to identify. So I'd highly recommend against using eosin uh, as, as part of your counter stain, unless you had a specific reason for it. But if you just want to apply a hematoxin, do that without the eosin. Certainly there is a place for hematoxin and eosin in, in, in your immunohistochemistry, and it would be on a separate tissue section, just to look at some of the underlying tissue morphology and architecture, uh, or give you a greater perspective on that outside of the immunohistochemistry. So it would be on a different tissue section. Here's some other counter stain choices that are popular out there as well. Methyl green that gives you a light green nuclear stain and a nuclear fast red that gives you sort of a pinky red nuclei. Now these counter stain choices are not exhaustive by any means, but they're the most popular ones to use. And you'd have to probably have a fairly good reason of why you'd want to wander away from these or look at others like Gim sustains or something like that. Again, not an exhaustive list and others certainly do use and publish on using other counter stain choices. Now let's get into why apply a counter stain. And certainly uh, the first question when, when considering that is, do you actually need a counter stain? I think that's a fair question to ask. And the example I've got here on the right hand side is a triple label immunohistochemistry. We've got a, a cytokeratin marked here with a red alkaline phosphatase substrate. Uh, we've got a CHI-67 highlighted here with uh, some brown DAB. And then out here, I believe it's CD34 using vector blue. So in this particular example of immunohistochemistry, now there'd be no, excuse me, there'd be no reason why you would add a fourth color. Uh, there's, you know, no value to that. Indeed, it may be problematic and would detract from that specific staining. So the question you want to ask is, does the counter stain add additional information or does it actually subtract or negatively impact the specific staining of my given uh, application? And sure, I've got an example here of a triple label. Think back to that uh, title slide image, the one with the lymphatic endothelial cell marker uh, and indeed the arteriole. You can see the value of a counter stain there. So certainly uh, a, a single label, uh, in some instances or in most cases would benefit uh, from a, a, a nicely counterstained uh, specimen. Now some investigators, uh, even if they are doing say a triple label or something like that, just follow through an SOP and dogmatically apply a counterstain because well we've always done it this way or it's part of the SOP or I was told to do it. You know just have a look at the actual uh, methodology you've got there and ask the question, 
is the counter stain going to be a benefit to me or is it even required? So don't be a victim of lab dogma and be told, oh, apply the counter stain for a given period of time because you've always done it that way. You know, that's a bunch of nonsense. And, and quite frankly, uh, if you want uh, good staining, good results, uh, just ask the question, do I need to use a counter stain? Here are some commonly used combinations of counter stains. Uh, brown hematoxylin shown here on the left hand side with a blue uh, nuclei uh, stained with hematoxylin, a uh, brown DAB, excuse me, uh, with blue hematoxylin. And over on this image here uh, on the right, uh, brown DAB uh, toning for a different antigen uh, in contrast with a nice methyl green counter stain. A couple of other examples here uh, on the left hand side. Uh, Vector VIP, it's a purple color in contrast with the methyl green. And over on the right hand side here, a, a smoky bluish gray uh, deposit here using Vector SG in combination with a nuclear fast red or this pinky stain. Uh, some of those uh, who, who may have eagle eyes out there will also see this third color, uh, which is actually uh, melanin deposits. This is actually a, mel a melanoma preparation. So those of you who might be looking for alternatives to what you're currently using or, or to mix it up a little bit. There are certainly a number of different combinations you could use. These examples here are just to give you an idea of what is possible, uh, what is acceptable, what gives you a great contrast out there. Not exhaustive by any means, but just gives you some insight into other color combinations. Okay, this gets us into what I see as a, a key issue that some investigators uh, encounter when applying a counter stain. Now what I've got here are two sections uh, that ha just happen to be serial sections of breast carcinoma that have been stained using immunohistochemistry for estrogen receptor uh, using a brown DAB. Now estrogen receptor is a nuclear uh, expressed antigen and so it, it does deposit in the nucleus of cells. And certainly hematoxin also is a nuclear counter stain. So what we do see quite often, or what we encounter from investigators, is a scenario such as the one shown here, whereby we have a very robust or a heavy counter stain that masks or obscures the specific stain of the estrogen receptor. And unfortunately, this would be interpreted as a false negative. Uh, you have to be very careful with counter stains in this situation, and you want to get more of a, a light or a balanced counter stain, such as the one that's shown here, whereby you can differentiate the brown uh, estrogen receptor localization in contrast with the other blue nuclei. And certainly, uh, you know, from the Ventana Roche, what the term they use is visual acuity. So you've got to aim for this nice light balance counter stain that works in concert or parallel uh, with your specific stain. So be cognizant of the localization or the intensity of the target antigen staining. Certainly this is one scenario uh, that plays out quite often that we've encountered uh, with, with end users. So how do you get from the left image to the right image or what do you do? What, what are the parameters to consider? And certainly have a look at the length of time that the uh, specimen uh, is exposed or incubated uh, in the counter stain. There may be pH differences as well, and also the use of a differentiator. I'm not going to get into the uh, weeds, so to speak, on the use of progressive or regressive counter stains at this time, but just be aware that there are differences in the counter stain and what I'd highly recommend for uh, any new tissue block that you uh, are starting to cut into or look at is to run a negative control whereby it is just for counter staining only. A tissue section that's been freshly cut and uh, exposed to your counter stain of choice, whether it be hematoxylin or methyl green or whatever, and try and get this light balanced look or counter stain appearance before wasting valuable time and effort with your immunohistochemistry. So just make sure you run that defined negative control section. Now if you remember back uh, earlier on I did describe a little bit about some of the various formulations of hematoxylin 
that are available. And I've got here an example of Harris hematoxylin and a Mayer's hematoxylin. And I did say they do stain the nuclei blue. And at the end of the day, sure, they would all be suitable. But just be aware when you are applying some of these counter stains that some of them may contain solvents uh, such as ethanol or alcohol that may have a detrimental effect on the specific substrate of choice that you're using. It may affect solubility or intensity of that given stain. And so if you do look at that under the microscope prior to applying the counter stain, you may say, hey, this is really nice specific staining I've got here. But after the counter stain, it may look a little duller or washed out uh, or indeed, um, you know, have suffered some sort of um, uh, washout effect. So in these cases, I'd highly recommend uh, going with more of an aqueous based uh, counter stain recipe. Okay, some other considerations for counter stain specimen fixation and preparation. Certainly the type of fixative uh, can influence the uptake of a stain. Now a lot of these parameters, and I'll say that maybe the fixation and the blocking of a specimen may be outside of your control, particularly those who may be working in, in core facilities or a CRO. You may simply be handed the material uh, and be asked to work up an immunohistochemistry stain and counter stain it. It's certainly imperative at that point, working with an unknown uh, to run that defined negative control of just a counter stain alone, just to get a feel for that intensity of the counter stain. Also the mode of fixation as well can play into uh, uptake of stain and the appearance of it. Now, if you remember back to that original slide again, on the title slide where we had that uh, lymphatic endothelial marker, that brown circle with the nicely stained adjacent arteriole, uh, those of you who may be familiar with some histological applications uh, would be familiar with the fact that that would be an immerse fixed specimen, something that was excised and placed into fixative. Uh, if that was perfuse fixed, then that particular arteriole would be much thinner walled and the nuclei that you'd be targeting with the counter stain would be more spindle-like, they're you know, squished if you will, uh, and that would be affect the uptake of the stain. So just be aware also of the mode of fixation when you go to look at it and also when you run that negative control. The thickness of a specimen in terms of the micrometers is also important as well. And I'll just draw from a real life example, just from a couple of weeks ago, some investigators from Cornell uh, called up, they were using uh, fresh frozen materials, cutting the sections at about 20 microns. What they were doing, cutting the section on a, on a cryostat, mounting onto a glass slide, performing uh, fixation with paraformaldehyde, you know, about two to 4%, and then immediately applying a counter stain. You know, this particular material had not been exposed to xylenes or ethanols or anything like that, like a paraffin embedded section, and they weren't getting uptake of hematoxylin. And they're scratching their head saying, what are we doing wrong? Uh, can you help us out? And basically they had to address some permeability issues there. So we described putting on some tween 20, Tritonex 100 detergent, and that significantly added to the uptake of the stain. So just be aware of the thickness of the section and that can certainly play a role uh, in the effectiveness of the uptake of the stain. Tissue type also factors in. I know a lot of investigators simply don't work on one type of tissue, but if you're working on say, the example I've got here is lung tissue, you also wanna look at the expression of the same antigen in kidney tissue, take a step back a minute and just understand that the, these will be different tissue types and it will factor in with how the counter stain appears on that given tissue. So run that negative control. This is also a factor if you are working between species as well. Uh, certainly I've got an example here of an amphibian species. You're working on skin or cardiac muscle with that amphibian. You wanna to swap to mammalian species. Again, more than likely that counter stain will uh, be a little different in the way it does behave on that different species uh, tissue. So again, just be aware of that uh, and all things will not be exactly the same. So work it up on that negative control. The method of application certainly does factor in as well. And what I've got here uh, on the left-hand side, 
uh, is a slide, you know, just showing a manual application here. Uh, I'd say this is particularly important for counter stains that do require heating. Example here is methyl green. Some investigators put a slide like this on a, uh, a heat block, then apply the methyl green that requires heating to 60 degrees, uh, and then they, they take it off uh, for, after a given period of time and notice that it, there is no sufficient uptake of stain. You know, for something like this, I'd highly recommend a batch staining where you put the slides in a slide dish, submerge them in a volume of heated uh, counter stain, 300 to 500 mLs, so you get uniformity and consistency across all of your slides. Now, certainly if you're working with any more than say three slides, I would highly recommend using this batch staining method as well uh, to get that consistency and uniformity as well. Just be aware of the fact if you are changing between counter stains, you want to mix it up. Not all of them are the same. As I've just mentioned, methyl green requires heating. That's not a requirement of hematoxylin or nuclear fast red. So again, uh, don't expect methyl green to look and behave exactly the same as hematoxylin or fast red. Be aware of the fact too that these do have shelf lives. Methyl green, for example, should be a nice deep dark forest green color. If it has tinges of brown or rusty brown, certainly it has expired, so you will have to get fresh material. So a quick summary here of some of the key points that hopefully will help you get some successful counter staining. Number one, establish that a counter stain would be beneficial in your given specimen. Secondly, select an appropriate counter stain and substrate color combination. We did show you some, there are many others you can choose from. Understand the target antigen staining pattern and expression level. If you're looking at a very weak nuclear antigen, obviously you're not going to drown it in the, in the counter stain. You need to get that nice balance and visual acuity. This is where you'd want to run a defined negative control and work up those uh, defined staining parameters. As we just mentioned, any more than say about three slides, I'd highly recommend using a batch format for consistency and uniformity across all of the sections or slides that you're working with. And certainly use fresh or non-expired material, obviously for the best, best results. Uh, for those of you who may be interested in learning a little bit more about some counter stain substrate combinations, we do have a free poster here. You're more than welcome to uh, access, uh, to sign up to, to get uh, through this particular URL. This gives you an idea of the, the uh, dimensions of the poster, but we do have some valuable information down here about substrate combinations and substrate counter stain combinations. So at this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for staying with us for this webinar. Please tune in for our next webinar, Considerations for Selecting IHC Detection Reagents on October 6. So thank you again, and at the moment, right now, I'll open the floor up to any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Craig, for that presentation. We will now begin our Q&A session. Okay, so our first question is about methyl green. Um, how can I troubleshoot light or weak methyl green staining to improve uptake? Yeah, methyl green, uh, as, I, as I did mention briefly in the presentation, it is certainly different from something like hematoxylin. Uh, it does require heating, uh, usually to say 60 degrees is the recommended temperature range. And one of the uh, issues I did mention uh, is about uh, investigators who may have a heating block handy and they actually put the glass uh, slide down on the heating block that's set to 60 degrees and then apply the counter stain right on top of that. Uh, and, and that unfortunately does not generate a sufficient uptake of the stain. So number one, I'd highly recommend heating a volume of that counter stain to, you know, either in a Copeland jar uh, or in a staining uh, uh, rack or dish, uh, of, you know, 300 to 500 mLs, I think I mentioned, heat that to 60 degrees, then submerge the specimen in that preheated solution. Additionally, methyl green in the methodology also has uh, some steps 
washing through acetone, acetic acid, if I remember correctly. Those can certainly be uh, reduced in time, so you can reduce the exposure to those, or indeed, in cases of very weak staining, you can even omit those uh, just to retain maximal methyl green staining. So hopefully those couple of points uh, will will certainly help you out. Oh, the other point I'd have to say is just make sure that it, it doesn't look you know brown or, or off-colored, uh, and that does have that, that the stock solution has that uh, you know dark, deep, a green color to it. All right, thank you, Craig. Okay, the next question is about automated IHC. So they, they use automated IHC and their counter staining is not always the best. Do you have any suggestions to improve on this? Yeah, I, I will say I did really not touch on automated uh, staining in this given webinar. Um, Certainly, that 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 may be uh, particular to well things you can you can certainly determine at your end. Maybe run it manually initially on a couple of different tissue sections just to gauge the parameters. As we mentioned, things such as time uh, or whether or not it's it may be uh, differentiated required or indeed the actual formulation of the counter stain you're using make sure it might be one I'd recommend as with an aqueous base media, maybe just run it manually and then see if you can get those same uh, determinants, same parameters set up on the automated stainer. Uh, so they would be things to consider. But, uh, you know, I, I think that, that that may be particular to the choice of counter stain uh, and maybe the methodology of how the counter stain is also applied in that automated stainer. And I'd have to say that, unfortunately, that's that's beyond the scope of, of this, this given webinar. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is about hematoxylin. What is the optimal differenti differentiation step for hematoxylin, acetic acid, acid or HCL? Yes, yeah, certainly I do know that, at least in the formulations of some of the different hematoxins, there are different acids that are used, uh, but the different differentiators you know may be particular to the actual uh, formulation of hematoxylin you're using uh, so I don't know that there's a universal answer to that uh, indeed uh, I would highly recommend looking at the formulation or the recipe of the hematoxylin you've got there and certainly use an appropriate differentiator for that and this is where it'd be important to run that uh, negative control section, that test section, uh, just to gauge some of those parameters. Look for consistency. Make sure that you run that uh, one or two test sections for each different tissue type and certainly species of tissue that you're working on uh, just to gauge uh, that, that intensity that you're looking for that you will find appropriate for that given application. All right, thank you, Craig. Uh, the next question is, um, what are the major differences between regressive and progressive counter stain? Yeah, progressive stain uh, tends to be the longer you leave it in there, uh, this is painting with a very broad brush, uh, the deeper stain you will get. And I'll refer back to the uh, couple of sections I showed of uh, breast carcinoma, whereby the very heavy or robust staining we showed in the image on the left was a hematoxin uh, progressive stain that had been left in there uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, so certainly with a progressive stain, uh, you can gauge it by leaving it in for a short period. If the staining is not intense enough, put it in again. Uh, and obviously as you move forward or progress like that with the length of time, uh, you get a, a deeper, more robust or heavier stain. A regressive stain is usually something that's overstained uh, and then you use the differentiator to, to, to uh, hone back or peel back the intensity to the desired uh, contrast that you want. So painting with a broad brush, that, that's, that's the sort of key differences between progressive and regressive counter stains. All right, thank you, Craig. Uh, the next question is about hematoxylin. Uh, so my hematoxylin counter stain is very dark and shows poor contrast. I've already decreased the incubation time down to 10 seconds. What else can I do to troubleshoot? Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, certainly um, the concentration uh, may factor in as well. Just make sure, and, and I'm not sure if you are uh, making the hematoxylin yourself uh, or indeed buying this from a commercial source. Just to let you know, uh, 
the example I use there of the Gills formulation, uh, you know, type one, type two, type three. Type one uh, is like a single strength hematoxylin. Type two is like a double strength. Uh, type three is like a triple strength hematoxylin. Uh, so, so certainly the concentration of hematoxylin there, if you are using say a Gills, very strong, very quick uptake of the stain. You may want to look at a different formulation of hematoxylin, such as like a Gills-1 uh, or indeed uh, uh, another uh, type of hematoxylin uh, that, that would, would help you. Another uh, opportunity uh, would be possibly using a regressive type hematoxylin whereby you can control the intensity by then applying that differentiator and dialing back that intensity, almost like washing it off until you get that desired intensity. All right, thank you, Craig. Uh, our time is up for today for this webinar. Uh, please feel free to join our next webinar October 6th about selecting IHC reagents. We will send you the entire recording of the webinar after, after this session. And if we did not answer your questions, we will answer them personally later. And please feel free to submit any more questions uh, through our general email, technical at vectorlabs.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye.